Hi guys, my name is Amir Yakub. I am a Grammy Award winning engineer, a producer and a writer. Um, and I am here today um, to do a masterclass for you guys um, in association with Sonarworks and their launch event in which I'm looking forward to opening up a session uh, that I worked on uh, not too long ago and showing you my approach to drum mixing um, I have been fortunate enough to work with some of the biggest names in pop music. Um, I won a Grammy for my work with Rihanna, but I've also worked with people like Sia and Neo and David Guetta and Will I Am, and you know, the list goes on. I'm a big fan of Sonarworks and I've used their products for a long time now. I use them everywhere I go, really, uh, whether I'm in a home studio or in, in my actual studio. Um, and to just provide me with a bunch of confidence in, in the sound that I'm hearing back um, and, you know, all of my gear that I've invested in over time, I feel like Sonarworks are, are really allowing me to get the most and the best out of that gear. It's great that I can show you guys some of the stuff that I work on and how Sonarworks really contributes to me doing the very best I can in, in terms of the music that I'm making and working on all of the time. Okay guys, um, so here we have the session for Lexi's song, which is, I've named it Be Your Fire, but the actual release was called Fire. This was a song that I mixed and mastered um, for Lexi, who is an artist from the UK. Kind of like got lots of pop, R&B, soul, country kind of influences in her music. She's a great, great singer. Um, and I believe this uh, song was produced by a producer called Quants. Um, so, um, we are here today to discuss, obviously, um, the drums. Um, but we're going to show you a little bit of the bass as well, actually. Um, because I believe those two sections, the rhythm section, if you wanted to call it that, um, would be um, quite important in kind of establishing the foundations of your mix and you know having looked over this mix and all of that kind of stuff i i kind of try to honor the original sound as much as i could i think that's very important when you're mixing for someone uh, particularly if they've been sitting with the song for a while i'm not sure how long the guys um had been sitting with this song but obviously if i completely transform this song and uh, it was like a brand new song to them, uh, they would be quite upset with me because I would have just gone a little bit too far with all of this. So I'm going to show you what my approach was. When it comes to mixing, particularly drums, I tend to focus um, on that. You can kind of call it a mini mix in itself. But um, one thing I will say is that I tend to actually mix the vocals first. Um, just because I used to mix the drums and the bass first, um, but I generally tend to work on stuff which is vocal led and therefore, because the vocal is going to be the loudest, most important part of the mix. Um, in this case, I would have probably mixed the vocal first. I'm pretty sure I did that. Diving in to this mix, what you see, um, is, uh, kind of how I lay out my mixes a lot of the time. I've um, obviously got my track markers at the top, which tell me, you know, what's where and stuff like that. Um, and my drums are always at the top and they're always in red. And uh, I always have my bass in some sort of brown color um, underneath those. Today I'm mixing in Studio One and I exclusively mix in Studio One now. Um, although from time to time I am required to mix in Pro Tools or um, I am required to mix in Logic as well. So um, you can see kind of like how this session is laid out. Um, I've got my guitars here, very kind of guitar-led uh, track. I've got um, electric guitars in blue, pianos and other keys in um, these purplish colors, and then these effects in um, this yellow, um, sorry, green. And uh, yellow is for all of the vocals. Um, and, you know, it's uh, lots of lots of backing vocals. Um, not the biggest backing vocal mix that I've ever done, but... Um, that's kind of how I have my mix laid out. And when I begin my mix, I'm always thinking about gain staging and, you know, all of that kind of cool stuff. 
um, which is very necessary, particularly in the box. Um, as you can see here, my drums would be laid out here um, and my bass would be laid out next to it. And I've got a couple of extra bits and pieces uh, that you don't see on the arrange page, as it were, and you only see them in the console view, um, like these guys here. These are my groups and my parallel compression, which I'll start to dive into at some point. As you can see, I have Sonarworks here on my master um, output, um, and um, like I said, you know, I use Sonarworks everywhere I go, um, and um, generally speaking, I might, you know, tend to jump into Sonarworks and switch between uh, um, uh, my my room which is called the aquarium and um, this audio technica ATHM 70 x's which is my um, open back headphones that i like to use for mixing uh, when i'm not here so like i can take this session and i can just you know be in my bedroom or wherever i am kind of like finishing off doing changes to a mix if i need to do them so with this mix, um, I tend to really miss working on a console. Um, and for that reason, um, I use um, a system um, from Softube called Console One. I tend to work with this as if I was working on a console. Um, one thing you will probably have experience of is you know, you get all these channel strips and all of those kind of things um, from various different companies and they will allow you to get the sound of the console. Um, it might be an SSL, it might be a Neve, it might be whatever. And I'm kind of used to working on particularly m much of the stuff that I work on. I do like the sound of the SSL. So um, Softube here do a good um, SSL um, XL 9000K um remake as it were or or emulation and i am using that pretty much exclusively across this whole mix actually you'll see it's, it's it's like my number one thing at the top because um i like to do a lot of stuff actually on the um on the on the console as it were um before i move to further processing um and so when I am working, whenever I'm working um, in on a mix, I will I will use a system like Console One in order to yes allow me to get the sound, yes allow me to work in the way that I might be used to on consoles and stuff like that. But probably more importantly, allowed me to move very much quickly on instinct, as it were. So um, that is something that I uh, work with uh, very often. Um, this is the end of the song. It's usually actually where I begin my mix, funnily enough. Um, so, um, just because there's likely to be the most instruments and stuff like that. Um, and when I do my early, early balances, I will, I will do it, um, at the busiest part of the mix and then kind of move back to where, um, there might be other songs, uh, oh, sorry, other parts that I haven't quite uh, picked up and whatnot. Um, one thing to mention is, uh, here you can see at the top, these things here, you know, I've, I've gain staged it all kind of from there, um, and I've done that across the whole mix. So that would be on the on the on the uh, stems that I have, um, and obviously where you see zero, that's because it's a bus or it's a, you know parallel processing or something like that um, that I'm working on. So um, what I'll do is I will show you um, how it sounds now. Um, and then I'll tear down what kind of what I did to everything. So here we go. And so that's kind of like the end of the song. It's kind of like a half chorus, ending chorus kind of vibe. Let's dive into what I actually did here. So obviously when I start, one of the things that I will do is I will sit in with the kick and the bass, but I'm gonna show you just the drums first and then you know if there's if there's time we'll we'll have a little look at the bass. So I um I was sent two kicks and this kick snare layer. Um and I was also sent a bunch of um live drums as well. Um whether they were played live or programmed um you know, via some sort of uh, software instrument, I'm not actually too sure. However, um, there's a big consideration when you're working, obviously, with this kind of stuff. 
um, because you want to make sure that everything is cool, that it works together, that, you know, there's no frequency clashes, there's no phase problems, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So um, when I sat in with these, I guess, four stems, um, I had to be very careful in terms of how they were balanced, how they were EQ'd. And of course, I had to be mindful of any phase issues as well. There were a few things um, particularly that I did to kind of make sure that they were all kept in check. And then they sounded good on a bunch of different systems. So these four stems here. I had to be careful of obviously how they worked and and what the situation was with them. So here I have this kick drum. Which came with a little bit of flavor on it, obviously look, kind of got that reverb and all of that. Um, here I have this kick drum. Much more kind of electronic sounding, punchy, kind of adding that extra kind of knock. Uh, this is a kick and snare layer. And a snap as well. Um, and here I have the live drums. Um, which kind of obviously as 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 those live drums would they're kind of really pushing that song forward and 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 they're connecting with um particularly the acoustic guitar rhythm in this song so you know i had to be mindful of all of that kind of stuff when i started processing these um two things the first thing that i did was um i picked up um, the first kick and the second kick. I wanted to make sure the relationship between those two was good. Um, and so I would have started obviously on console uh, with these guys and um, I would have been working on trying to get them to sound like they work together. So the first kick, uh, the very first kick that I played you, uh, that guy I basically did almost nothing on console to this almost nothing um the only thing that i really did was a, a slight filter um and i probably did this because i wanted the bass to dominate underneath 60 hertz and so therefore i cut this out remember it's not what about something and it's not about what something sounds like in solo it's more about what it sounds like all together um your listener will never be able to press solo on your kick drum and go oh god can't believe they rolled out you know everything under 60 hertz um on that guy um because they'll they'll generally always hear it with the bass which is kind of sitting in and working on that frequency range um so i rolled out um underneath 60 and then we have this um drive and character section here on console and this is basically me adding yeah maybe a little bit of volume um, maybe a lot of bit of volume, but it's fine because I've worked it out um, and I'm used to this whole system. But um, also um, uh, this character will um, move um, from second to third um, order harmonics. And so if I go plus in, into the plus region, it tends to be brighter. And if I go into the minus region, it tends to be darker is probably the best way um, and simplest way to describe that. So um, obviously from working on consoles and just working with, you know, outboard gear in general, I would have been really used to kind of like pushing stuff and, and trying to get, you know, some extra juice out of it. Um, and in, in this situation um, here, um, this kick um, would have obviously changed its, its dynamic, um, its tone uh, somewhat um, as a result of that. And so a before and after isn't exactly going to be um, <laughs> matched in level um, because I will have definitely added some level with this drive here. 
Um, but I will give you a before and after. So I will take I'll take decapitator off as well. I haven't shown you what I did there, but um, I'll take console off. And here it is without the console. So I then went went and put that on as well. Um, and you can probably, like the difference will be minuscule to you guys just because of the fact that, you know, we've basically got um, everything under 60 being removed. And if you don't have a system which represents it very well, you might not be able to hear that very well. Um, but um, Decapitator did a little bit of work here. And, and, and you know, I tend to, I tend to work with Decapitate quite a lot. You'll see it um, on uh, quite a few things in my mixes. Um, and I kind of just wanted to add some fatness. Um, and to be honest, like I love some of the presets that are in there. So I just loaded Drum Fatner 1 and... It's adding that slight bit of bump Obviously, this kick is mixed a little bit lower because this is the more acoustic sounding kick, which is just giving you that kind of flavor and um, energy of the acoustic with the little bit of ambience and stuff like that. Um, I couldn't really hear like, you know, uh, the reverb is kind of like plugging the low mids and some of the highs, um, extending that kick out nicely in terms of um, the envelope of the sound so I didn't really feel like there was much more to do there on the second kick however you can see I've got some decapitator happening I'm going to obviously mute that for, or, or bypass that for now um, and here I did a little bit more on console so on console what I did here was I um, obviously rolled out everything below about 100 um, uh, Sorry, below four, uh, 46 here. Um, and um, I gave it a little bit of bump around 100 because this is the one that was adding the slight knock, that kick. And I felt like in that range, kind of giving it a little bit of a bump around uh, 3dB there um, of bump. Um, it kind of helped to, you know, give that kind of knock um, and, and help that rhythm and groove to work. Now, one thing that I did here, one thing that I do quite often is work with a transient shaper. And um, luckily, you know, we have um, we have one inside of console. It's basically Softube's own transient shaper. Um, and um, I've added some punch to this kick to kind of like help me, as you can kind of see, go from uh, that punch being there, push that into a, um, to, to, to this EQ. Um, and um, obviously, like you can see, I've boosted the input gain there as well. Um, and so like I've I've obviously then I've rebalanced it and so on and so forth. But, you know, this should show up quite um, quite heated on this meter, um, which is why when I AB this, it will sound like a, a lot um, lower in level. I'll try and I'll try and you know rebalance that for you slightly. Back over to the drive section and you know I've 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 given it a drive of about six and and this character here I've rolled it down to um to second um to give me that slightly darker sound because I don't need the tops on this one because I've got the tops really on this one. Um and so when you're working and balancing two kicks, if you ever get to send two or more kick stems. Um, it's not unheard of to have quite a few kick stems. Um, make sure that everything is doing something different in a different part of the frequency range is adding, you know, a different feeling or a different vibe. If there are two that are too close to each other, um, mute one of them and see if the mix actually sounds better because generally speaking, it probably will. Here I have this kick and uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just roll this input gain down so you can get a, a, a fair assessment of this. Um, so here it is without console one. And here it is with, and this is level matched as much as I can um, for now.
so you should hear the difference there um but obviously i was driving this in about that much so i kind of bought up the level in a cheeky way uh, i rebalanced it then on the fader um there um And one thing to mention is when I start my mix, I usually give myself plenty of headroom on my master um, fader or my, you know, whatever whatever you call it, whatever DAW, like this is, I suppose it's my output fader in, in Studio One. Um, but I, I give myself plenty of headroom to grow because I know that I'm going to be adding stuff which is going to add to the loudness, um, like saturation, you know, distortion, um, parallel compression, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so once again, I went into Decapitator, went to basically, it looks like I've got exactly the same setting, practically just copied it over um, to add a bit of, you know, um, gel between the two. Um, sometimes from time to time, you know, I will, you know, select both of my kicks and put them to one bus and stuff like that. But I didn't choose to do that in this instance. Um, but this has obviously added some extra knock to it. So um, without and it's working quite subtly as well. So uh, these two guys uh, now are working hopefully very well in tandem with each other. And that feels good to me, um, you know, like that's obviously how I felt it would be uh, It would be appropriate to balance those. This kick snare layer, I'm just going to jump in there. Just going to show you Decapitator to show you that I practically did the same thing. Um, just copied it over um, and tried to get that kind of like glue, particularly between the kicks. Now, um, here I've not really done anything. Um, I thought obviously it was balanced well. I thought it was all good and the only thing I did was with this character I've kind of pushed that up um, a little bit to add like a little bit of saturation and make that sound brighter. So now with this layer in um, obviously you're going to hear the snaps and you know all of that kind of stuff coming through um, a little bit more and so we're, we're starting to work on obviously not just a kick sound we're starting to work on other sounds as well. Um, this is actually sending to my drum reverb and my drum reverb is a, a very simple Valhalla um, room reverb and you know it's uh, it's basically a very simple setup um, kind of like large room mode um, I didn't choose a default or anything like that but um, I would have timed the delay time to be a uh, decay time to be short um, and as a result of that Obviously, um, I'm not getting a um, drum sound which is extended for a long time over time, um, but um, high cut at 8K just to make it sound um, a little bit darker and a little bit further away. Um, that's what tends to happen when you roll off some of the top frequencies. Um, and um, this is also allows me to push this sound back in the mix a little bit. Um, so my drum verb... Um, this is being sent to my drum verb a little bit, this kick snare layer. And I thought, you know, it, it, it is important that that is in there because the producer wanted it in there and, and, you know, the artist as well would have liked that layer and so on. So I did honor that. Now... Here on my drums, on my live drums, I'm going to switch to those quickly. Um, here's where I did a little bit more work. So you can see there's much more engagement happening there in stuff. Um, one thing that I've done is, um, aside from the transient shaping and the EQ, one thing that I've done here is I've done a little bit of compression on these drums. Um, I've driven them quite hard um, on the on the console. Um, obviously, I've made up for that somewhat by bringing the volume of that back down on the output. But um, here, I think, um, if I remember correctly, I remember just thinking, look, these guys do need to 
these guys do need to lift up quite a bit because of the fact that they are going to um they're gonna they're gonna be connecting with the acoustic guitar rhythm quite a lot um and so the drive of the acoustic guitar um particularly in the choruses of this song um they're gonna need to be supplemented probably by these live drums um and to give that extra live additional live feeling just to run you through what i did here got a low cut happening um under about 112 um that kind of means that the kick in this um in this dr uh, live drum uh, stem is is going to be there but it's not going to be overly present it shouldn't get in the way of the other kicks that i've just been working with i've got my now i've, I've kind of like really pushed the punch on this one because i wanted them to be punchy and also with the compression here, what I've done is I've gone for a ratio of six, which is kind of like medium-ish, but a fast attack and a fast release, which means that, you know, the punch is kind of caught, um, but you will still feel enough. Like, this is kind of like the longer end of fast. Um, and this is a um, RMS compressor as well. So this is essentially what would be an SSL um, 9K um, RMS compressor. I am working with that because I'm trying to get the general overall kind of squish together feeling um, of, of the drums without it kind of like really taking away from that punch. I want it to feel smooth um, and I still want it to feel punchy. Um, but you have to obviously be careful and you have to find that balance when you're compressing drums just period like you know no matter in what in what context because you don't want to take away the punch you don't want to do anything that is detrimental um but you want to have enough of that stuff there um and this was really just about containing this drum sound um so it feels like it has its own little spot in the mix somewhere like i said i've driven it quite hard to get that kind of like you know um extra saturation coming out of this um i've boosted around 6 30 and um there's a shelf going from 21k upwards um and again this is the equalizer that is built in to the console this might sound quite different um when i a b it let's just listen to those in iso and that in iso for a second And so put it on again. And one thing that you'll notice as well is that my fader rolls up and down. Um, particularly when I have live instruments or live liver sounding instruments. Um, and when I feel like there needs to be a little bit of a push, um, in you know one specific part or whatever i like to make my mix move and and my drums aren't really moving they tend to be quite static a lot of the time you know um and i want them to be able to move and so automation is uh, is going to be a key there and so i just did that slight little lift up there on that little fill um and that allows me obviously to push that fill in the listener's face a little bit and then I reset the drums back to um, the um, previous level. So I'm going to play that with all of these layers in now, the ones that we've spoken about previously. And so you know pushing those kind of like little fills up and stuff like that particularly in that section because it does lead us into a chorus we want to draw that listener in for that period of time and then kind of like let them let them ride out on 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 that groove on that on that little beat um throughout the whole chorus um so i reset that obviously to an appropriate level so that it's not overpowering and it sits in with all the other drums 
Um, oh yeah, one other thing on this um, is that I used Ozone Imager um, and uh, just to make sure that, that 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 low end was sitting like tight, 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 tight. I noticed it it was quite wide um, on that um, on that actual stem. So I think without it, I'll show you how that kick was kind of showing up on this meter. And to ensure on a on a good system on well on all systems that this comes through and really punches through, I've just basically monoed it. And that's everything below 140. Um, and so you know that's going to allow it to sit in nicely with the other kicks as well, which were all they were they were all fine in terms of monoing and stuff like that. From time to time, producers will um, tend to widen stuff. Um, just generally without thinking about, you know, do we need to widen this in this frequency range or that frequency range, but mixers, we definitely need to think about what ranges are being widened and what ones aren't. Um, um, not that it's a sin to widen a little bit, but um, in the low end, but you know, um, I try and keep everything under 100 as mono as possible, just brings that tightness to the record um, a lot more. So the other layers that we have here, um, we have um, the snare. Um, so there's a snare there. And again, um, I've gone for a filter, um, adding punch. God, I've added a lot of punch there. <laughs> um, some drive and some character. Um, I've panned this slightly off to one side as well. Here, I've done the opposite panning. So I've panned it to the right by 10 just adds that slight width to the snare sounds kind of separates them slightly as well leaves a gap in the middle for that vocal uh, particularly in in this range um, again uh, a low cut where I thought it was appropriate um, some um, punch <laughs> I say some quite a lot with a transient shaper um, and um, adding um, some uh, 1k um, on this snare with uh, the inbuilt equalizer, uh, the console equalizer essentially, um, adding some drive and making that kind of brighter characteristically. Um, so my snares um, again came to me well. Uh, the reason I use transient shaping a lot, let me just show you. The reason I use transient shaping a lot is because um, I find that compression. Um, on individual hits is not really so much of an issue um, because they tend to be programmed in terms of velocity fairly close together um, unless it's very dynamic um, programming then I might reach for compression to kind of even that out to control the level um, but transient shaping just allows you to really get in and uh, and think about how that element contributes to the groove so if you do want your snares to snap a bit more then add some punch um, if you want the tails of your kicks to come in take away some sustain i haven't done this in this mix i didn't feel the need to but from time to time that is something that i will do to really lock that kick in with uh, the groove uh, don't be afraid to uh, you know go to the extremes if you if you if you feel like you need to um, remember there's other layers kind of like that are doing bits here so kick snare layer uh, and my live drums both have a snare sound in them obviously um, and so uh, to kind of help these guys to stick out over the others um, thinking about your panning and your levels obviously I haven't really changed the level here um, but thinking about all of those kind of things, um, I obviously have chosen to use transient shaping uh, to help me out. Um, so these, again, these guys are going to the drum reverb, um, uh, which is over there. I guess, oh, actually, do you know what I'll do? I'll take my drum reverb off for now. Um, I guess um, hearing how they sit in. Let's take these away. Okay, so without console and the treatment that I've done on the console, much, much flatter, less brighter. Um, 
and much more punch um, with them on. Um, and then I had this reverse snare here. Didn't do, I did barely anything to it because I didn't think it needed anything. Um, so this is kind of like an, an in between kind of like pulling you in kind of hit. And I've just balanced that appropriately. And then we've got a clap again, accenting the back beat there. Now this clap, I, you can see I've kind of balanced it a bit higher. Um, I've also added punch to this. I've kind of cut out a lot of the low end um, from everything from just about 180 downwards. Um, a bit of, um, <laughs> it says low mid frequency on here with this equalizer, but a bit of a one, 1 1.7, um, that I boosted up um, and drive and character and um, without it you probably wouldn't be able to hear it in the mix uh, and again let's just go uh, and take these off for a second and hear this And so hopefully you can hear the difference between that as being well. I mean, it's got this, it's got ambience on it, and I suppose that ambience is amplified a little bit because I've driven um, that sound a little bit um, and uh, made it brighter. Um, but you can hear I've kind of like sucked out some of the um, lows and low mids and tried to refocus my energy um, around you know one point seven. Um, in order that it kind of sits in with everything else, but also it has its own moment to shine, its own spot to shine in this drum mix. So here's what that sounds like with that. And obviously that being there, um, you can hear that what I've done is um, really brought out some of that ambience, which has now kind of extended the kind of like feeling of this groove. Before this stem was in, it was much snappier and much tighter. And it's really, again, it's really about honoring the reason why that clap is in there with that reverb. Sometimes I would go back and, you know, ask the producer if that reverb was getting in the way, I'd ask the producer to please, you know, give me give me a, a dry and a wet stem. But in this case, I think it's absolutely fine that it's turned out like that. Um, then we have the programmed hats, I guess, um, which are here. And these would have taken a little bit more aggressive um, cutting. I've obviously driven these up and I've made them sound brighter with the character. I've panned them off just slightly outside um, my snare on the right as well. Um, and as they are in the mix, this is what they're adding. So they're adding that kind of like extra sizzle up top. And then I've got a tom stem here. Now with my tom stem, what I've done is I've gone in and just bumped up, you know, with a shelf actually, I've gone in and bumped up uh, 150. Some driving character, obviously, some of my favorite things to do. Um, but also um, I've cut some of the um, sub frequencies in that one. Um, and uh, I've gone in and with Ozone Imager, um, I've just made sure everything under 140 as in these toms um, are coming through a little bit more mono than they were on the original stem. Uh, so when I add that in, uh, well, hopefully this plays um, at that point. I'm not actually sure if it does. Let's have a look. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Where is it? Tom. It doesn't play at that point. Um, I'll, I'll take it to a different part of the song. Let's go to chorus two. Uh, yeah, let's just do that. Mm -hmm. 
and again, it's about really honouring what that is doing in that groove as well. It's obviously the boom, 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 kind of giving you that, um, you know, the slightly more offbeat kind of hits. Um, and that being there, just honouring that, but also making sure that I've balanced it correctly. You know, you can see that I've dropped the level of that um, a little bit as well. And then finally, in my drum st um, stems, I have this percussion part. And this percussion part, really, I didn't do anything to it um, over here. So just some driving character. And again, you know, just, just if you feel that something doesn't need anything done to it, then don't do it. Don't do things aimlessly. Really, uh, is what is what, what the uh, the lesson is there. Um, this percussion stem sounds like this. And so it's kind of like this kind of like driving sub rhythm um, underneath everything, um, and you know again just trying to just trying to make sure that it fits in like balance wise i didn't feel like it needed any eq or anything um so um without it oh, we don't want to introduce the bass just yet yeah <laughs> let me just mute the bass And so the way I balanced that was just more for feeling. And that kind of like interacts a little bit, obviously with some of the acoustic guitar stuff, but there's some like vocal beatboxing style percussion that kind of happens in this song as well. So it's kind of like supplementing that. So making sure that, you know, all of that is um, is working well. So um, once I balance my drums, they go to a group. So they all output to this group. Um, in this group here um, really doesn't see any processing um, because it's kind of just like a pass through thing, but mainly it's set up for me to um, get some parallel compression going on. So parallel compression is an important part of my process. Um, and um, I feel like it brings a lot of positivity to um, my drums, particularly. Uh, drums aren't the only thing I parallel compress. I do com parallel compress other things. One of the things that I love about it is that it really adds, yes, a little bit of loudness, but it adds uh, a lot of weight and depth to um, what you are working on at that time. So when I put my um, drum, and everything you've heard so far has been with my drums going through this parallel compression chain, right? But when I put my drums in, um, I usually don't do parallel compression until I've handled every single element of the drums. And then I will work on parallel compression. Um, and my parallel compression, I just do tend to do just on the console. Um, and my real thing here is to get a compressor. Now, this is the FET compressor. Um, and is, again, this is the one by Softube. So what will happen is uh, this will be more like an 1176. Um, and I'm going to basically slam the living daylights out of these drums. Uh, that's what I want to do because I want to get that signal just absolutely squished up um, giving me um, hopefully lots of nice stuff um, and then um, mix that back in um, uh, to a level where I feel that that's a good level without, you know, obviously any phasing issues or anything like that first and foremost, but also um, without um, any negative effects on my sound. Sometimes, you know, depending on what your drum balance is beforehand, like if you have like cymbals and hats and all of that stuff and they're balanced quite loud, sometimes when you push into parallel compression, like I might just jump on here, put take the equalizer and um, put this into shelf and then just bring that down because I don't want my parallel compressed drums to be sounding overly bright and adding overly brightness to this um, um to this um, drum mix however um like i've kind of done that a little bit here by taking this character and rounding it all the way down sometimes i tend to drive a little bit harder as well um into console like get more saturation etc etc 
first and foremost, it depends on what's happening in the compressor and what the compressor is giving me. I like to do this all on um, on on the console first um, before reaching out to other compressors if I feel like that's you know the vibe. Sometimes in line here, I will also add like additional, you know, a distortion saturation that might be decapitator, it might be tape, it might be, you know, anything. Doesn't doesn't really matter. I'm not really fussed like um, what I'm adding. If I feel that it needs more grit, then I'm going to try and do that. So without parallel compression, um, remember this is my drum group uh, with zero processing on it. Without parallel compression, you'll feel the drums will be a bit flatter. And now with. So they don't quite jump out as much without the parallel compression. But with it, they're definitely jumping out. They're definitely rocking a lot, a lot, a lot harder. And that's what I like to hear. Um, this is what my parallel compression sounds like by itself. Obviously, it sounds awful. Um, I will put put it up a little bit and then I'll bring it back down just so you can hear it. And you can see, obviously, what's happening there is I've got a quick, a a quick attack and a quick release in this instance. Um, people will do parallel compression in a bunch of different ways. And the thing that I will probably say is that I, from time to time as well, I tend to um, mess around with the uh, release time um, and mess around with the amount of gain reduction that I get. So this is actually, funnily enough, this is... Um, a little bit tamer than I usually do parallel compression because I will usually just slam it so the meter's kind of like sitting around here. But I felt like I needed something a bit more open um, on this specific song um, and this specific drum mix. Um, so I'm going to try and bring this back down to where it was. I think it was around about there. It's fine. Um, and um, with this here, um, you, you've obviously heard already what it's adding to the situation. Um, so no parallel compression. And yes, I'm aware it may, I make it um, I make it slightly louder as well. And um, it's not really that that my ear is attracted to. It's more uh, the additional ambience, you know, that I'm getting from some of the reverbs that are on the stems um, and so on. And I haven't actually added my drum reverb in here, but I would there. So now you get a picture of what my entire drum mix sounds like. And I'll take you over the processing that I'm doing on my drums group. So you can hopefully hear there that, you know, when I add my parallel compression and my drum reverb, which is what I've added at that point, um, and that's what I was just a being between, um, I get a much taller, wider drum mix um, happening there, um, which actually seems like it has more depth, has more bottom and all of that kind of stuff as well. One thing I will say is on my drum reverb, I have added this um, widening to the reverb itself. And in console, the way that I've treated my drum reverb is just to add some drive and character there. Um, sometimes I may go in and I may be like, you know what, I need to roll out all of the low end. Oh, that's not the... Um, I need to roll out all of the low end um, or all of the, you know, up to 500 or maybe I'll do, you know, even slightly higher than that sometimes, 600, 1K, just whatever I feel I need to roll out. But, you know, I felt like, you know, leaving this a little bit more full range kind of, you know, adds that ex extra excitement uh, to it. Do notice that I'm not sending my kicks to my drum reverb. I very rarely will do that. And if I do, um, it'll, be a, it'll be a short reverb that I would send it to, probably an independent reverb of my other 
drum reverb um because um yeah i don't like adding extra um complications <laughs> in the low end um with um adding reverb and if i did um add reverb to my kicks they would be definitely eq'd all of the low end out so that's just uh, another thing to note finally on my drum reverb um sorry not my reverb on my drum group drums all here um i have lifted up around 3k quite drastically you know i'm not i'm not going to lie here um, but it's what I felt I needed to do in this drum mix, probably in the context more of the mix itself. Um, and um, having uh, added that, um, I've also um, added um, a little bit of drive. Um, this really, this drive thing only starts to tickle when you kind of push it over five. Um, so, you know, I haven't really added loads, but kind of trying to homogenize the sound a little bit. Um, and a slight bit of um, uh, brightness to the character of that drive. But what's doing um, the work here is um, tape. So um, using tape, um, what I'm doing here is I am obviously adding a little bit of um, a boost to the top there. Um, uh, I gen generally start to, to um, start with my favorite drum bus setting, which is this one. Um, and then I'll go and just uh, vary the amount. You can see with that little asterisk, I have played with this setting. Um, and, uh, you know, vary the amount um, and, you know, look at what kind of um, distortion I am getting off it or THD. Um, and... I've added, bit, I've added more wobble to this than I usually would. Um, it was obviously doing something positive. Um, so um, just a bit of driving in and then making sure your output is working um, uh, with you. So uh, without this, and in fact without console as well, let's just take both of you guys off for a second. Without this, uh, this is what my drums would feel like. So I've got my drums rocking um, and you know that's probably where I would have left my drums mix and just to kind of like give you an insight into my bass mix there because my bass uh, I felt had a lot to say in this song the bass stems that I received were two separate ones one which was a sub uh, bass uh, kind of sound which is electronic and then a bass guitar which isn't really playing during the course so I won't really focus on that one but I'll focus on what I did to this sub bass sound here so this is uh, obviously driven with character now i've i've really pushed the character up in in in, in a um in a bright direction here um just because uh, i want it, this to stick out on on smaller systems um and so i usually do an ab between um my bigger speakers and my smaller speakers um, to kind of get this sitting up in there. Um, I use this uh, Red DI um, by Kush, um, uh, which is a cool one. Um, and I just went in and obviously um, just um, changed the level amount, um, but also uh, the um, the base level, as it were, um, and worked with, you know, um, you know, checking what it sounds like. If I flip the phase, does it sound better? You know, all of this kind of stuff. Um, in this case, I don't th believe that I did think it sounded better, so I just took it back to what it was before. Um, and then decapitator um, here, um, mid driver allows me to push the mids um, uh, of of this bass sound so that it sounds better on a smaller system. Um, and I've done a little bit more to help me with that on this bass group here as well. But what I will show you um, here is um, how these individual plugins uh, contribute to this bass sound. So I'm going to mute my drums for a second um, so we can listen to just the bass. Um, and I'm going to try and, in fact, I'll just try and take some of this processing off as well 
I'll take that off. Um, so you'll hear this. This bass will definitely, you know, come up in level. Um, take this processing off as well. Um, so here we go. So I don't really have anything over like 500 on that bass sound, 500 hertz. Um, so this red DI is going to help me out a little bit. And, you know, that's just going to give me a little bit of niceness there. Um, if it's not really adding anything um, up top, um, which is what console would have done um with the slight brightness in that um in in the drive decapitate is what's going to add um a little bit more and you can hear that i'm adding those extra harmonics there um by um having that decapitate a sound in play so here's the original stem It definitely sounds a little bit more gnarly now. Um, in On my bass group, because I did group them together to kind of homogenize the sound, um, really console, I don't really think it would have been doing much apart from, yeah, just trying to add that extra bit of bite up top. Um, but then obviously max bass can be very helpful in getting yourself to have um, those extra harmonics kind of push up. Um, particularly from lower sounds. So um, I'll turn both of these off. And so, yeah, you can hear that kind of like, it's kind of extending that top a little bit. Um, particularly Decapitator and Max Bass here are quite important to me um, for that reason, particularly. Um, and then um, adding parallel compression here um, on here, I've used just the peak compressor um, with um, a fast attack and a fast release, a ratio of 100 to 1, which is, you know, like absolutely basically just limiting. Um, uh, I've added some drive here and, and the character is uh, is a darker character. So I'd obviously wanted this for the lows and the low mids rather than the upper frequencies. Although, again, I can choose to do whatever I want to do on parallel compression. Um, and I'm going to play that to you just as it is by itself. Um, and then without it, and then with it, so without. And yeah, so I bring an extra bit of loudness, a little bit of loudness, but you know, not in a in a harmful way at all. So um, finally, um, all of my bass, like, and that really, this all bus is 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 here to combine these two sounds. Um, all of my bass um, is going obviously through console one with nothing happening to it at all. Um, I've got FabFilter Pro MB happening here, um, and I'm gonna actually remember what I did there. Oh yeah, um, so a bit of um, right. Okay, so I'm doing a bit of limiting in the in the sub bass there, um, and then I have the imager just bringing the sub or, or everything below 120 in to mono because again. The bass was widened here, and then I've got tape 
which is obviously um, giving me some saturation and so on. Different settings here to obviously what you would see on my drum bus. Um, but let's just get these kind of moving. Um, so I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll activate them one by one. So you'll hear like a bar or two without it, and then I'll I'll start activating them. And again, one thing you will have noticed here is like there's some uh, there's some automation going on. So this is moving around a little bit. Um, this is probably to pull you in and out of different sections and stuff like that. But just notice what's going on here. Um, so you'll see, you might not see it happen on my drums bus, but I'm going to play these both together now. Uh, you might not see it ha happen on my drums bus, but um, you m should see it happen on my bass bus here. This obviously is meant to link in with like rhythmically, particularly these acoustic guitars. Uh, I don't think there was any electric guitars in the chorus, but I'm going to open up some of the rest of this instrumental here. Um, so you can kind of hear how it kind of all fits in um, in the context of the mix. And some of the major keys here, it would have been, you know, some of the parallel compression that I've done. So if I was to take those buses away, you know, my, 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 my rhythm section would kind of fall away in this mix. I just want you to hear how I'll start it without and then I'll drop it back in so you can hear that. And so that you can hear what that's doing and it's really anchoring and solidifying uh, obviously those guys in, in the mix there, which is which is very important um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I will open up the vocals so you can hear um, the entire mix. Um, actually, just one more thing to say is like towards the end of my mixes, I do a little bit of processing from time to time. You know, that's just some mid-side EQ um, on my buses um, there. But this is what it would sound like actually with the um, with the actual um, entire mix in play. And so what I will say is like I could obviously go back and 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 just go here and 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 you know turn off all of the processing as it were um but my mix would entirely fall apart because the way that I tend to work is all of my gain staging um and all of that kind of stuff is kind of done as I go along and I know how much headroom I have and you know all of that kind of stuff so 
I tend, you know, you'll hear this mix fall away in 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 level. Um, uh, the drums and the bass fall away in level more than you will, you know, most other things like tone, tonally or punch wise or anything else like that. So this is what it would sound like without any processing. And that's uh, no drum reverb, no parallel compression, no console or anything that I've done to decapitate a max bass, anything like that. So you can hear, obviously, like, I, I know this because I, I've i done this for years now and I kind of know how to build stuff up and whatever. Um, but generally, you know, if I was if I was teaching or mentoring someone, I would I would tell them to be gain matching and level matching and all of that kind of stuff on the way out um, of plugins and so on and so forth. So um, it's always good to keep good practice of that kind of stuff. But... Um, particularly when you're a being, but then, you know, like for me, I know, I know how far I can go. I know what kind of levels I can push up to and all of that kind of stuff. So, and, and I know when I'm fooling myself as well. So, um, always keep that in mind, but yeah, I hope you've enjoyed, um, uh, this session. Um, and just to play you out on this, uh, I will just let this run, um, Let's go to let's go to when things get a bit more exciting. Like I know she was before. I wanna give you everything she gave you in my And that song is available to stream on all good streaming platforms. It's called Fire and it's by Lexi. Thank you guys for having me today, Sona Works. Um, and thank you for everyone who has tuned into the masterclass. Um, I hope that you enjoyed yourself. I hope that you found things that you can take away from uh, from today's session if you would like to follow me on social media my name is amir music on all platforms uh, that's a a m i r m u s i c i hope that you keep making great music and thank you once again for joining me today